hello, hello. <laughs> we have all of us up there anyway. Hello, good morning, you guys. We'll go together Tuesday. I am back. I'm Teresa Coates. I'm the National Educator for Shannon Fabrics. And today I am here for a special version of Sew Together Tuesday. It's National Embroidery Month. And so we are spending a little bit of extra time with some folks that will be able to help me out. Um, so thank you for joining us. As always, we'll be giving away a kit at the end of the program today. So you can uh, leave a comment, question, all of that good stuff. We want them. But if you want to be entered to win the kit at the end of the show, please share the video with your sewing friends and the sewing groups that you're a part of. Let them know that um, you found this great video. We've got lots of good information for you guys today. So like I said, it's National Embroidery Month. So this whole month, we're focusing in different ways on embroidery. And today we're focusing on machine embroidery. I began working with the machine embroidery Gosh, I think it was, I think it was like, like last April or last May, I got the machine and I have a baby lock pathfinder and I love it. And I have been trying to poke my way through it and learn a bunch of different stuff along the way. And um, I keep asking questions and like we were talking about before, reading the manual, trying to figure out what am I doing and watching tutorials and all that good stuff. But today I decided that the smartest thing to do was to bring on some experts. So today we have a couple of people that are joining me. We have Mike Johns, who is a baby lock educator and Sheila Ryan, who is a brand ambassador for Shannon Fabrics, as well as a designer behind um, Designs by Baby Moon. So both of those are, they are embroidery experts. I am a cuddle sewist and not an embroidery expert. So we're bringing them on. They're gonna help figure out a lot of things. We're also partnering with Anita Good Design today. They are an embroidery company. They sell a lot of different designs and we have used a couple of their designs. Uh, Sheila and I did to give them a try, see what happened, and then just sort of work through the issues that we've got. So um, we're gonna do a whole lot of talking about the basics about embroidery. And then we're gonna talk about some specifics on why is this doing that? Or how do I fix that? What do I do to prevent that? So, um, so we'll bring those on. So if you can bring um, Mike and Sheila up, let's see if we can bring them onto the screen. Um, and then we'll add, there we go. Um, so we'll bring them on and then we can all be here. Um, and then another little camera, sorry, we'll figure it out. But anyway, we wanted to have you guys all on here to talk about embroidery. So Mike, can you introduce yourself just a little bit and tell them who you are more than just a baby lock educator? Hey everybody, I'm Mike Johns. I am a national educator for baby lock and I'm also the owner of Mama's Boy Design, which uh, is uh, my, my studio name, so to speak, but I travel around the country. I teach people how to use their baby lock products, how to do things like embroidery and surging and sewing and digitizing and all those wonderful things. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, Teresa. So happy to be with you. I am very excited that you're here. All right. So um, so let's introduce Sheila. Sheila, you've probably, if you are part of our I Love Cuddle Fabric group, which is a fantastic little Facebook group, then you have seen Sheila's name pop up there in her little face on her icon um, a few times. So she is uh, an integral part. So Sheila, tell us more about yourself. Hi everybody, I'm Sheila and I'm the designer behind Designs by Baby Moon and um, I've been doing machine embroidery for about six years and I cannot, I haven't found something that I don't love embroidering on um, and so one of my favorite things has been lately embroidering on cuddle and um, I, I make embroidery designs but I'm always investigating what's going on inside the embroidery design. So I think this is going to be a super fun conversation because even um, as a digitizer, someone who makes embroidery designs, I am continually learning different people have different processes in putting their embroidery designs together and different materials react differently with embroidery. So we're going to talk about all of that today. So it'll be super fun. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I'm really excited you're here. I also have to mention the fact that you're you're in your car today. So <laughs> let's just deal with that because it is kind of a funny place to do a tutorial. But as many of you have probably experienced, there is a huge snow and ice storm coming through America right now. And Sheila's in the middle of it. Lost power this morning, correct? Yep, just, it's fresh. <laughs> Fresh, fresh and new. So we're just doing it on the fly. So she is joining us with her samples in her car. And I appreciate you very much for taking the time to extra to do this to make sure that we could make this happen. So thanks. I appreciate it, Sheila. <laughs> All right. Um, so Michael, would you do me a favor and see if you can hit the button that's next to the button that you're on to see if we can get the two people 
up like that. No, nope, it still doesn't work. Okay. We had three people up there earlier and I'm not quite sure how we did it. So anyway, just trying to figure this out. Okay. Thanks. Um, all right. So we have our guests. What type of embroidery? So that's what we want to talk about at first is embroidery on cuddle. What kind of embroidery do we want to do? We were talking about it earlier, the three of us and about embroidery and how it is different doing it on cuddle than it is doing it like on cotton or canvas or denim or anything like that. So um, I know with one of the things that I've had, we've talked about, so let's show the, let's show the little sample. So Sheila, if you've got yours, you can bring yours up too. But um, here's the sample that I did. If we can bring this down, we'll look at the sample that I made that's using the Anita Good Design. We talked about this a little. So Sheila has hers too, and she did hers. She completed hers. I stopped here because mine started to do this thing that frustrated me. So we talked about it just a little. And part of this is because there's such a dense design on both of ours that putting it on a knit fabric then makes it do this thing where it sort of puckers, right? So the best kind of designs for cuddle, we could do this kind of design, but we need a little extra work right in the stabilizer department is that correct yes okay okay so if we want to do the easiest kind of embroidery for cuddle wouldn't necessarily be something this dense right yeah i and and what one of the things that i've learned is that you can do anything you want to but there are some things that you can do with your embroidery to make it work best right got so, it so we can embroider anything if the machine will handle it you know um mm -hmm. but um but there were some things that um that i look for in certain embroidery designs and this this design is adorable he's an adorable little. Oh, um, they're super cute yeah. super cute um but it, there's a lot of stitches and so what one of the things that um you need to think about when you're doing embroidery is embroidery is actually adding extra fabric to the fabric that you already have so thread is fabric is made out of threads and then when you do embroidery right. you're actually adding more threads into the material so the embroidery threads push the fabric out of the way right so that's functionally what's happening and we can compensate for the things that happen with the pushing of the original fabric with stabilizer there's all kinds of cool stabilizers that we can use um, there's tools that we can use like sticky spray and we can put basting boxes around the edge. We can do things to the fabric beforehand, like we could pre-quilt it, or we can add, um, you know, some knockdown stitching. All of those things mm -hmm. treat the fabric so that it can take the embroidery that we want to do. So, got but, it. So, so, is there any motif or any style embroidery that we just we can't do at all on cuddle, or anything is possible as long as we just have the right tools? I think anything yeah. is possible, but. It's a, it's a situation where if you're not sure, you want to experiment first. So you want to use a scrap fabric, keep your scraps. I'm all about, let's try it on a scrap first and see what happens. Got it. Yeah. And I think it's a great idea for just about any technique that you're trying to learn is trying it. Yeah. On scrap first is a great idea. So the motifs can be anything that we want. Um, if we're doing certain things, we're just going to change the way that we're going to do it. We could talk about that a little bit more as we go. I just want to make sure that we're talking about the right stuff. So cuddle, you can use regular cuddle or Lux cuddle. I know Mike, you did a little bit on just like the regular cuddle three, right? I did. Yeah. Do you have any, any you know, issues I, with that? Yeah. No, it works beautifully. You know, I mean, I just did some, um, I just did some lettering just that built into one of the machines and it's just, a, it's called the storybook font. And you can see that it, it did beautiful. It stitches on there just mm -hmm. perfectly. Now, kind of like what Sheila was saying, it's knowing your fabric, right? The better you know your fabric, the more you can make good decisions on how to do it. So this is the exact same design. But you can see that I've added something to the background there that's called knockdown stitches. And we'll talk more about that later, I know. But that yeah. makes that work even better. So um, really and truly, just echoing what Sheila said, it's all about knowing what your fabric is, how your fabric acts, and knowing the right tools to work with that fabric. So as long as you've kind of got that in your arsenal and you know kind of how to go in and address what's happening with the substrate that you're going to be stitching on, you really aren't limited. You can go in and pretty much stitch any kind of design that you want on it, whether it's line work, red work, fill designs, appliques, you know, what have you. Um, and it's really just going to be more about making sure you're using the right tools for the right project and knowing that that design is going to work if you combine this tool with that tool or this technique with that technique just to get the best um, outlook. But 
I will really echo what Sheila said. If you're not familiar with the way that's going to work on the fabric that you're test doing, do a test stitch because yeah. um, there's nothing more frustrating than spending, you know, two, three hours stitching something out. And at the end, it's not what you wanted it to be. If you did that test stitch first, you could really kind of address some of the issues that might come up as you start out um, working with a new material or a new fabric for sure. Right. And that, yeah, that absolutely makes sense to me because I feel like a lot of times we want, we get so excited about a project. We're like, oh my gosh, it's going to be so cute. We have to do it. And then we jump into it and feel like we've wasted a bunch of time. So yeah, trying things out first is great. So I've done a bunch on the regular cuddle, just cuddle three. I've tried that a bunch of times and I really like it. Um, I did a little bit on the Lux cuddle. Let me see if I can grab my, um, so I just did a design See if I can put this down, you guys can see it. So I did a little design. I still have my um, water soluble. We haven't talked about tools, but I have some water soluble still in here. And I see that this worked out really well. I'm a little afraid to take that water soluble out. So would this be a place where I need to do a little something extra to kind of flatten down this middle part? No? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, okay. it depends on what you want for the final look. If the final look is oh. you want that, that Lux to be coming through and kind of fluff up, then I think, you know, you don't need the extra, but if you wanted it, you know, flat and a smooth surface, then that's when you go down and you start using some of those other tools that you have, like knockdown stitches or something like that. Okay, great. So I'm just, I'm pulling this out. We'll see what this looks like. Um, Cause I haven't done a lot on Lux and I know people do it. One of the things that people really want to do, so you can see, I can kind of fluff that up a little bit. So if I want to keep it flatter, that's when I would do something special. Here, I could let it sort of fluff up and be okay with this. Because I know one of the things that people like to do is they want to be able to um, do this on like blankets to monogram a blanket or to really, um, I don't know, some some way make it personalized for one of the Lux throws that we do. And I think this is a great idea. I actually really like this. I think it's totally fine. Um, I did one, if I can find my sample. Sheila, did you have one to show? I do. And I, so when I'm doing Lux cuddle, I'm going to, I'm already thinking I'm either going to do an applique with regular cuddle on top, or I'm going to use some knockdown stitches and I'm going to use the other tools too. Like I'm using five of five spray pretty much anytime I'm embroidering on cuddle. Um, I'm not a hooper. I don't hoop my fabric with my stabilizer. I float things. And so because I float, I have to do things a little bit differently. Um, but I'm using 505 spray. I'm using a great cutaway stabilizer. I like a medium cutaway. Um, okay. I don't use tear away a whole lot using cuddle unless I'm using some specific projects. But with with cuddle and Lex cuddle, it needs the support because it's a knit fabric and a knit's going to stretch. I'm going to use a good cutaway stabilizer. But I'm going to show you my sample up here. And, um, and what I pretty do, that is. I just did, I did a monogram. So this is my son, my oldest son, his monogram. And um, I used an applique font, but I didn't put applique fabric in it. What I did instead is I put a knockdown stitch behind the applique uh -huh. design. I used embroidery software to do that. So I put the knockdown in and then I let the applique stitches run just as an enhancement. So, and then the only other thing that I did is um, it, people that have, puppies when you take them to the dog groomer there's like some little bitty trimming that they do to get you know right above the eyes and the nose you know and so I feel like that's what I um my next door neighbor's a dog groomer so I'm I'm always picking I'm like how do you do that so I think that's what I'm doing here is I'm trimming those little pieces you know those extra fluffs inside the the divots you know the little dips in between the letters so I just trim just a little bit so that my my knockdown stitches are holding it all down Got it. And then I'm just trimming so that that fluff isn't covering up any of my stitches. Got it. So, so the Lux cuddle isn't, isn't an issue. We just do it with Lux cuddle. We take some different steps with it. Yeah. Just take some different steps. Got it. That looks really great. So we'll talk more about knockdown stitches because this is something I have to learn about. Um, I want to reiterate, if you are watching this and you are being like, Oh my gosh, this is a lot of information. It's a lot of information. We have a download that's available on our blog. So if you go there, you can actually download that sheet and it's gonna talk about a bunch of these things as well as it's space for you to take some notes. So you can take some notes and you can also rewatch this video as many times as you want. It'll be on YouTube after this um, as well as Facebook. So you definitely come back and reference this, but some of the information will be on that sheet. So if you wanna download that and then take some notes, there's a lot to it and I feel like we all have so much to learn. And like 
Sheila and I have talked before. It's like every time you do it, you learn something a little bit different. You're like, oh, and then there's that. Got it. Okay. Um, which I think is great. It's a, the fun thing about this hobby in general, about sewing and embroidery and quilting and all of that is there's just so much to keep learning. So, um, okay. So we can totally do it on any of the fabric, cuddle, lux cuddle, any other fabric out there. Um, you can also do it on uh, embrace. And I don't know if you've done that on our double gauze. Have you done that, Sheila? I haven't. Why haven't I done that yet? Okay. That's what I'm going to do. I haven't really either. So that's going to be another video that we do down the line here. We do. <laughs> okay. So we'll do one all about embrace cuddle. So let's talk about tools. We did just a little bit. We talked about stabilizers and stuff. When I first got my machine, I just got like a beginner kit, a starter package that had a whole lot of different uh, stabilizers and stuff in it. And then I was like, I don't really know which ones to use for what. So for me, like I said, I really like, I like the idea of the tear away because then I'm just going to tear it right next to the stitches. It's going to all be gone. It'll be beautiful, except that's not exactly what has ever happened. Um, it ends up sort of doing this, the pucker thing, like my my big dense thing does, it ends up with this look, but even worse is what I found. <laughs> so tell me what it is. We can't use stabilizer or the tearaway stabilizer, or we just should use something else probably. I, I think really it comes down to the fact that you've got to keep in mind that the the um, the cuddle fabric is a stretch fabric, right? So it actually has stretch give to it. So the one thing is, is when you're embroidering on something that has stretch, it needs to have some stabilization to it or else what Sheila was talking about earlier with the push and pull compensation is really going to be amplified because the stretch itself is allowing it to push further away and you're going to get more distortion. So um, really and truly, if I'm doing something that's got a stretch, I don't use tear away. I do use a cutaway just because of the fact that it's going to be something that I leave in the project after it's done. So it helps to continue to contain that stretch. Um, if you use tear away, it eventually goes away. I mean, even though it's not meant to, it's not like a water soluble or anything like that, it just doesn't have the integrity that a cutaway does. So if you leave the cutaway, behind the actual design, it's forever there. So a great example of that is if you ever look at somebody's polo and they've got a um, they've got a logo stitched on it, if you see somebody who they where they've used tearaway over time when that's been laundered over and over and over again, that starts to get really kind of buckled and puckered and look yeah. kind of weird and stuff. If they've used a cutaway behind it, it has a longer life to it. The longevity is there because the cutaway is staying back behind that. And, you know, your pillow is made out of a knit as well. So it's a stretch fabric as well. So that cutaway that's in there is basically maintaining the integrity of that design. And it'd be the same thing on your cuddle fabric. So I think really and truly the better choice is to use a cutaway. And I'm kind of like Sheila, the medium, the medium cutaway works great. So um, if you're going to use a tearaway, then you need to think about putting some kind of stabilizer behind the actual fabric itself in between the tearaway and the actual fabric. So like for would that be something use, yeah like like the pellon like the the um the interfacing the iron on yeah and it really is interfacing it's not stabilizer like it's so funny and in border we talk stabilizer all the time right I mean it's like one of our big conversations but um like shape flex is is one of the brands Pellon has a shape flex baby lock has a shape flex all of, but they're basically they're interfacing they're not stabilizer so they fuse on right. um and if anybody's never seen it it almost looks like a um it's almost like a fusible trico it kind of it kind of has the feel of like a fusible trico, so um, that actually yeah. gives that stabilization to that. So even if yeah, there you go. That's exactly so what there I'm we doing. go. Yeah, I use it all the time. We use it a lot for stabilizing cuddles. So when we want to do um, like patchwork with cuddle, this is what I put on it. So this is the fusible side, and then this is the woven side. So it's just like a very 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 thin cotton with a fusible on it. So I could iron this onto the back of it, then do my embroidery. If I really wanted to use a tear away, then I could do that. So if I use a cutaway and I put it in my blanket, is that going to make that corner really stiff? Uh, yeah. It depends on which cutaway you use. <laughs> I mean, we have, <laughs> we, have, we have cutaways that go from really, really lightweight cutaways all the way to super, super heavy cutaways. If you, you know, if you throw in a heavy, like a two and a half ounce cutaway or something like that, then yeah, I mean, it's going to be the corner that stands up by itself and, you know, while you're, and you do it. But if you use a lighter weight, I don't think you'll find that to be an issue because it really doesn't. Honestly, if you if you use the lighter weight or the medium weight care, tear way, I mean cut away, the stitches are actually going to have more of a stiffening effect than the actual stabilizer does. 
Um, Got it. So part of it, so part of what I need to figure out, like when I'm doing a project, just like thinking into the future, if I'm going to do a project, I need to figure out what fabric I'm using. So if I'm using a cuddle three and then what I'm going to do with that project and how stiff I mind it or don't want it to be, then I'm going to choose my stabilizer based on that. Correct. Well, I think it's really, uh, it, it's the combination, right? It's the fabric right. plus the density of the stitches, plus the hooping technique that you're going to be using, you know, plus the, you know, there's so many factors that go into it. And that's one of the, I think really one of the most interesting things about doing embroidery is that it's, you have to have that arsenal of tools and you kind of put them all together to get the right effect. Right. And, you know, so it, it really is the combination of the two. And that's why when somebody calls you and says, Hey, I had these puckers, how can I fix that? Then you start going down the list. Well, did, what did you do for this? What did you do for right. that? What did you do for that? So, right. um, but yeah, I, th I think if you just pay attention to your fabric substrate and you pay attention to your density of your design, those are the two biggest factors that play into it. Got it. Got it. So, um, Sheila, you use a cutaway, a medium weight cutaway is what you use for most of yours as well. I do. And, and, and so we use the stabilizer, but I don't always leave it in. I mean, I, the, obviously the stabilizer is right behind the stitching, but, um, I think I learned from the people that do like embroidery on, uh, commercial polos, you know, when you're doing stuff like that, you're going to cut away around the back of the design. I mean, the stabilizer away. So that's why it's cut away. It's, yeah. It's not tear away where you would tear it. And then I feel like tear away sometimes can pull the stitching and, and do things. Mm -hmm. But when you use cut away, you're just going to trim just a little bit around. And what I do for that is I just hold on to the stabilizer and I let the fabric fall away so I can see exactly where I'm trimming. And I just trim about a quarter of an eighth of an inch away from my stitching all the okay. way around. So it's not in there. It, it doesn't right. stay in there. Right. So okay. Adding, so, so yeah, so I've got a little piece that I used just a, a cutaway in here. So I would just take and cut this. I can use my little scissors and I'm going to cut it here and then I just cut around it, correct? Yeah. Do you do you have a technique that do you do you cut from the fabric side or from this side? I'm afraid if I cut this side I would probably cut the fabric. I'm going to try. <laughs> I would, I would watch. Cut it. You know, you got to you got to watch. Oh, okay, but you're right that if I let it kind of drop, the fabric moves away from it. If I can get my hand in there. Well, another okay, tip there is to use applique scissors. If you use like a like a double curve scissor or something like that, that's going to help you not oh. cut the actual fabric as well because it's going to keep it from being snipped in. Like she this cute little pack it. I got from Kabori. <laughs> there you go. So are you, these are the little scissors here, these guys? So yeah, you could use about? those. You could use your duckbill scissors oh. that you have in that kit as well. So you could use your snips right. that are in there. So any of those would work because they have the curved tips. Got it. And that will keep it from grabbing the fabric, correct? It helps you not to grab, yes. Yeah, okay. And so I want to just leave a small, so I could kind of cut a cur around it big and then come back in and get here lots closer, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't want to because I've noticed that some places, if it's if it's a tight enough thing, I could probably pull that out, but I don't want to. No, Correct? I would leave it. I would leave it because it because it is supporting your stitching. So yeah. that's the other thing that it's supporting the stitching. It's working with the fabric. I mean, it's become part of the project. So mm -hmm. it'll look nicer if you leave, you know. But but you don't want that shield effect where you've got so much stabilizer behind that it's making the fabric stand out on its own. Right. So it's I always want to cut it out. But the converse to that is don't cut it up against the stitches. You do want to leave like like Sheila said, you want to leave about a quarter of an inch around it, because if you cut right up to the edge of those stitches, well, number one, you're probably going to wind up cutting your stitches. But number two, it'll eventually pull into the, to the stitches themselves and it won't give that support anymore. So you leave about a quarter of an inch. Got it. OK. OK. Perfect. So that actually worked out pretty well. Yeah. Happy with Can that. I throw something right. else? Can I throw something else yeah. into the mix? So we say yes. always use cutaway, but then there are times when you're going to want to use a tearaway. Yeah. So I, I Mark's make, like, yeah, I guess there is. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is. <laughs> so I make lots of in the hoop projects, and I use I use tearaway for those because I don't want anything stopping the squish. Right. So if I'm making a steppy for my kids to hold. I want it to be soft and I don't want, I don't want it to be stiff. I don't want it to be anything, but as an embroidery designer, I have designed it, the embroidery part working on kettle to do exactly what it needs to do with tearaway stabilizer. So when you get a design, read the instructions that came with the design. Did the designer intend 
for you to use tearaway stabilizer? Did they say you can only use this with cutaway stabilizer? Those are really important things to look at. And I think we see a design on the internet and we go get it. And the designer had no intention of you ever using that on, you know, wood or leather or whatever you're going to do it on. <laughs> and so right. we'll do we'll do what we can to compensate if we know the tricks, right? But sometimes the designer has some things built into the design to make it work right. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So part of it, like part of it is knowing what we're what we're doing in the first place, but also kind of looking into to see what the designer is, because that or what the designer says, because that perfectly makes sense is you want that to be squishy. And if I have a, a stiffer one behind the eyes, it's going to do these weird things. So that totally makes sense. Mike, when do you use a tear away? So if I do a tear away, it, it's going to be something that I know is not going to be laundered a whole lot, um, which would be perfect for what she was talking about, right? The the stuffies and things like that. You're not going to wind up washing those a whole heck of a lot. Um, so the thing is, is that I'm not worried as much about the wear and tear on the stitches and the distortion of the stitches. So um, it's just kind of like, again, it's like right back to what we said at the very beginning. It's knowing your project, knowing your substrate and knowing how it's going to be handled after it's stitched. So it's kind of mm -hmm. following through with that. But the one thing I will say, if someone is choosing to use a tearaway, keep in mind when you go to tear away that tearaway, don't go at it like a bulldozer in a china shop because it's, if you pull hard enough on the back, it will literally distort the stitches on the front because right. you're literally pulling against the actual top thread and the bobbin thread at the same time. So oh, I saw a thumbs up. That's good. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to put a little bit of finesse behind it. And the way I usually do it when I'm doing that is I like literally rip the tear away until it gets up near the stitches. And then I just kind of walk it along the stitches. And that way I'm oh, okay. pulling like one big force. So that's a big thing, right. especially on stretch fabric. Stretch fabric, if you're doing that, it's really easy to... And I don't know if this is the right word, Sheila, you might have a better word for it, but it's a really easy way to bury your stitches from the front. So if you pull hard enough on a stretch fabric, it will pull the top thread into the fabric and your your stitches will get smaller on the front. So Right, which isn't what you want. No. So this one, this is a little example that I did that I, I have a couple of questions I want to ask about. You can um, probably guess what those are. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> we'll fix this, fix this later. But this one I did a tear away. You can see it's so much thinner than um, the cutaway that I did on this one. Okay, so you can see that it's thinner. So when I do this, basically I can sort of tear, let me take it out of the hoop, and I can sort of, what you're saying is that you can tear it up to the stitches and then sort of pull it out of the stitches. Oh, like this. Yep, just like, like, like that. Because okay, I mean, so your, I don't stitches, want your stitches are basically perforating the tear away. So you're basically creating right. a, you know, a, a tear point. So it's it's easier to do it like that than just kind of to grab and go at it full force. Right, exactly. Which I could, you know, I, I think I've done the first few times that I was like, yeah, tear away, just rip that stuff out. <laughs> um, didn't really lend me with something that was useful in the end, which is frustrating. So, okay, well, that's helpful. So this would be an example that um, if I wanted to do this, like you had did sort of like on, you know, the front of something, this would be a great way to have that so that it'd be more morphable. I can see a little bit of um, pucker, but not too bad at all. So that's great. Um, okay, so we wanna use uh, cutaway most of the time, tear away when we have to. And then um, the other thing is water soluble stabilizer. And this is something that I think a lot of people don't really use in regular embroidery. Like if I'm doing it on cotton, I wouldn't necessarily use a stabilizer or water soluble stabilizer. And on here we do, and I know that there are two different kinds because in my starter pack, I got one that is a water soluble and one that is a heat soluble, heat mm -hmm. release. I don't know what they called it, but um, yeah, you could stick it under the iron and it would go away, which was super weird. But everybody tells me use the water soluble, no water, correct? Right. I don't, I don't like to use water soluble with cuddle because I don't like getting polyester fibers wet. <laughs> <laughs> you right. can do right. it. And I did do it. I did it specifically for this just to see what happens. And, you know, if you do that and you get it wet, like you soak it in a bowl of water, warm water, and then you can um, press the layers between the uh, layers of a towel. And then just like we were doing when we trim up our cuddle, like we're going to throw it in the dryer to catch all the extra lint. Well, you're going to just throw it in the dryer on low heat so that it doesn't, um, high heat will, uh, alter the texture of Lux Kettle, especially sometimes, right. but just try it on low heat and it's polyester. So it's not really holding on to the water. You just have to get it out of there. So mm -hmm. you can 
I don't like to because I don't like the way that feels. Um, right. And I'm going to have to try the heat away. I have never tried that, but that sounds really cool to try. Yeah. But I just <laughs> might look like you had a reaction there. <laughs> well, you have to be careful with heat away. Like um, for for our version, we call it press away, but it is you know it is heat activated and it and it kind of just dissipates out. But like one of the things that I found is if you do, I'm a, I'm a water soluble versus a heat away any day any day of the week because heat away um, you hit it with hot, you hit it with your iron, you, you with heat or what have you. Sometimes it can actually make like little. Uh, I don't know the right term for it, but like, have you ever played with like contact semen as a kid and you kind of rub it on your hands and it makes like those little bitty pills? Yes. So it's, it kind of can do that. And if you're dealing with something like, especially like on the Lux, because of the high pile content on the Lux, it could actually get in there and you might wind up having to pick those out. So I, in that case, I would use the water, I would use water soluble. But if you're talking about, um, so your, your heat away is topping now, it's not actually backing right it's not actually what you right. put in the stabilizer so the topper most of the time your toppers just tear away they're not you're really not even gonna have to use water you're not gonna have to use um i mean if you look at the sample that i did for the letter b i've got toppers still on it you can actually see that and so what i would do is i would remove my basting stitches and once i get my basting stitches i can literally just pull this away and it will go up to the edge and i'm not going to see any of that water soluble anyway so most of the time if you're using a topper like that um, you know, depending on the situation, you can just get away with not ever having to wet it or not ever having to press it. So it just kind of depends on the design itself. If your design has a lot of open spaces in it, then that's when you're going to find time that you're going to have to use water or heat one of the way to get rid of it. Got it. But most of the time I'm just going to be able to just tear it out. Yeah. So, and that's, that's what I've done with mine with the water soluble topper is I've just pulled it pulled it off and it's been fine. And then sometimes I have to get in there with my little tweezers and pull it out. Um, I did yeah. do a piece quite a while ago where I tried to do a big, very intricate, um, sort of like a red work design. And I just did it in the cuddle to see what would happen. And then I washed it to see what would happen after that. And basically it disappeared in there, which was a terrible idea. Um, so I realized that, oh, it will wash out. So all of, because trying to get it out of all those designs was too much to try to get the water soluble stabilizer out or the topper. So I tried to just wash it, which worked, but then I realized like that's gonna go back into what we were talking about with like knockdown stitches and doing something in the background to sort of keep the, the yeah. fibers in place. Yeah, your thinner, your thinner fabric, your thinner, your thinner line designs are gonna have to have a foundation to stitch on top of because if you put it on anything that has pile, like if anybody's ever done a monogram like on a towel, right? And you've done like one of those really fancy curly fonts, you know, like uh, the interlock like, font or like the this little guy font, yeah. yeah, like the one you were showing just a second ago. Um, if you ever do those, what happens is the the filigree of the letter gets sucked down into mm -hmm. the actual. Um, pile of the thing. So like on that one, you can see the curls of the first letter kind of aren't there anymore because they're kind of sucked down into yeah. that pile. And that's where you start doing the techniques of adding some kind of foundation stitches and, and things like that so that it has something to sit on um, so that you don't lose the detail. So that's right. also, you know, that's one of those formulaic things. What am I stitching? What am I stitching on? And then figuring out how you use some tool to make it work better. Got it. Good. Okay. So that's very helpful. So we want the stabilizer. We want a topper. The topper seems to keep things in place a little bit better. And from what, oh, I have a sample downstairs, darn it. And I forgot it. But what I did was a satin stitch along the edge. And so that little um, bird, I don't know if you saw it that I posted yesterday. And when I did the satin stitching around the edges, I didn't use a topper on it the first time. And then those um, fibers kind of came up through the satin stitch. So then I was like, oh, I probably need to put the water soluble on it. So you've got an example, Sheila? Yeah, I've got one where I did just that. So I did this one without water soluble on it. I also did, I did a lot of things wrong on it on purpose to show you, um, but I did it on tearaway. So, and I, I just do them on accident. <laughs> <laughs> I want to think that I've no, I know better, but you know, I do a lot on accident too, but I did this one on purpose wrong, but you can see, so the, the monogram and the satin stitching, they look okay, but they don't look great. And so when I do it the right way, and I use uh, this one, I use a cutaway stabilizer, um, and mm -hmm. I still have my water soluble in there. But look how that satin stitch around it, it just sits so nicely on top yeah. of the metal. I mean, it's really beautiful. And even the lettering, this is a font from Stitchtopia that's just beautiful, and I use it a lot. Um, but it's got some thinner spots, but it has some nice thicker spots too. Um, because 
where I'm going to use this does not get a lot of wear. I'm not going to worry about it washing and then um, that that sinking back down into it. But on the cuddle, it. it worked just fine. And so, yeah, you know, the, just, the edge it, looks so nice now. Yeah, it looks it's yeah. so much different. And let's put them side by side. I mean, you can really see the difference in. Yeah you know, the way that the, the fabric holds it up because I did, you know, I took care to use that water soluble on top and that worked really well. That's very cool. Good, good. And I wrote down yeah, my basting stitches just so you can see this. So I, I, that's what I was doing while I was looking down, but this was, this is literally all you would do when this is over with is you just start pulling this away and you can see it gives you a clean edge. And so like little pieces like that right there, a lot of times you can just pull it out with your finger, but if not, tweezers work great. And then the other thing that you can do, if you don't want to submer submerse your whole entire design, I just take a sponge with hot water and just dab. And if you just dab, oh. it'll literally come right off because hot water activates that water soluble a lot faster than cold water does. So if you just do a hot water sponge um, when it's all done and you can see, I just finished stripping it off and no sign oh, of that water great. soluble there at all. So it's, you know, I, I and that would be the same with heat away. If you had heat away on there, it would act the same way. So. Very good. Okay, cool. So, so we know some of the stabilizers that we need to have, the topper that we need to have. I do want to talk really quick about machines before we get too far into it. Um, otherwise, into like real technical stuff. So, machines vary dramatically, and there are a couple of different kinds of machines, from what I understand. Of that, there's combo like sewing embroidery machines that um, would could be a good starter if you are looking for to do both and you need a new machine. I would assume, but then it goes up from there. So. Mike, I'll let you say, I have a Pathfinder is what I have and I absolutely love it. It does a nice big, I think it's eight by 12. Yeah, that's my um, my big hoop is an eight by 12, which is really nice. But the smaller ones start little, correct? Like you can get yeah. small the, ones. In the Baby Light lineup, the entry machine is our Verve. So it's a really cute little machine. It, it has a four inch by four inch embroidery size field. So um, this is a great one. And it's actually a combination machine, which is kind of a lot of fun for it to be an entry level machine is it actually is a sewing machine and an embroidery machine all in one. So that would kind of be the entry level machine. And then from there, we just kind of move up in progression. We've got a total of nine different machines that are embroidered single needle flatbed machines. So We've got all the way down from the four by four. And then our largest, of course, is our Solaris 2, which has a 10 and 5 eighths by 16 inch hoop. So this is the top of the line. This is all of the bells and whistles. This one is also a combination chain. So you can see there on the screen, it's got sewing embroidery and it has um, our actually onboard digitizing program called IQ Designer. So that's actually built into the Solaris. But that that's kind of the bookends is those two. We have everything from you know, uh, the next one up from the verb is the Accord. We don't have a picture of it, but that's a five by seven. Uh, the Flourish, um, which is what I think Sheila has. Is that right, Sheila? You've got the Flourish. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the Flourish 2, that one has a six and a quarter by a 10 and a quarter embroidery field. That's the largest field on it. That one is embroidery only as well. Um, and then if we wanted to do that exact same machine with com a combination of embroidery and sewing, that would be our Adventura 2. Um, but then the Pathfinder, which is the one you have, Teresa, of course, has the um, 8 by 12. That one's embroidery only too. And we have an 8 by 12. That's a combo that's called the Aerial. So we have this whole range of machines. And, you know, I think sometimes people look at machines and they kind of get overwhelmed because they're just not really sure what machine to get, right? They're kind of like looking right. and thinking what machine is right for me, what machine is going to be the most useful for me. And I really think that comes down to number one, do you need a combo machine, right? Are you going to be doing a lot of sewing and a lot of embroidery and you want to be able to switch back and forth? Or are you going to be doing a lot of them and you want to be doing them simultaneously, right? A lot of people like to have an embroidery machine sitting off to the side, stitching away, and then they're working on something else like piecing a quilt or doing some clothes construction or whatever on a sewing machine off to the side. So you kind of have to kind of sit down and assess what makes the most sense for you as the person that's going to be using the machines. The other thing that comes up is how big a machine do I get? Well, that's really going to come down to your personal likes. I always tell people to... Um, try to find the machine that is going to be the most machine that you can afford, right? So if it's got features and stuff on it, as you move up in the line, there's going to be more um, more features built in, more capabilities built into the machine. Bigger hoops obviously becomes an issue at some point as well. And, you know, I always say buy what you can afford to buy, you know, uh, because you never want to do that whole, I mean, this happens with cars too, right? You get that buyer's remorse, you go home and you buy a machine, you buy a car or buy a machine, you get it all, and you're like, God, I really wish I'd have gotten this feature or that feature. 
Um, yes. You want a machine that's going to grow with you. You want a machine that's going to stick with you for a long time because it's an investment. I mean, it really is not, it's not something that we, you know, buy today and then two weeks later we go buy a brand new. Oh, I mean, some people right. can do that. I can't do that. It's like, <laughs> I have to have that machine for a long time. Um, so I always say buy, buy the, buy the best machine that you can afford to buy at that time. Um, but I'm also a big component of test driving your machines, you know, find a retailer that's going to let you come in and sit down and spend some time at that machine and get to know that machine and see what feels right to you. Because, you know, um, as funny as it is to say, machines have personalities and you have to sit down and figure out what that personality is and figure out if that personality matches yours or not. Um, and, you know, I, I will, I have no problem saying this. I have a whole studio full of machines and I definitely have my favorites, you know, and there's ones that I work on all the time. And, you know, it's just, I, I don't know. There's just, I want to make sure everybody kind of feels that there, there is a machine for you out there. You just have to find the one that fits for you and you have to find the one that is right budgetarily. Right. That's the big thing right. is get what you can afford, you know, um, and get there's, the best no, afford, really. yeah, we've yeah. talked about that before the best that you can afford like kind of reach just a little because you'll see like uh, for me a lot of it like when I got the Pathfinder and I got the Crescendo then I was like that's so much more sh machine than I need like I've sewn on a feather weight and a FOP 130 basically you do a straight and a zigzag it's fine I can do everything I need and then all of a sudden I was like oh my gosh and now I realize all of those features and how great they are so I feel like sort of stepping up into something that's a little bit better than you think you need is actually a really good idea. Well, give yourself room to grow because I mean, this, I, I think, you know, I, I, all, everyone that's sitting here watching us and everything, I'm sure if we did a little survey that it would become one of these things that this is addictive. This is crazy addictive. Yeah. You start and then like all of a sudden it's like, all you yeah. can think of is what can I be sewing? What can I be embroidering? What fabric can I own? How much thread can I own? Oh, I can make that. Yeah. <laughs> Do I have the newest and latest thing from baby moon? Do I have, the, you know, I mean, it's yeah. like, you, you get addicted to it. So yeah, you want to buy, you want to buy as much machine as you can afford, right? Because you are going to grow into that machine. Yeah. You're going to grow into it. So, you know, if you're a brand new, brand new embroiderer and a brand new quilter, like I own the verb, which is the little four by four. I have that. And mm -hmm. it's a wonderful machine. And I'll tell you one of the reasons that I love it is because my niece who at the time she was nine years old, she sat down and made her very first quilt on that machine. So it was just a wonderful machine for her to sit down and play with. And it's a great travel machine. That's another thing. Now, right now, we may not be traveling as much as we would, but that's something to think about, too. You're talking about a verve that I can pick up and carry with me versus, you know, can I pick the Solaris up and carry it with me? Yeah, but it's not easy. It's <laughs> right. Yeah. right, exactly. Now, we have the verve on one end, which is the really easy, like little movable and super simple, four by four, easy peasy. And then on the other end, you do have like the big guys. And I know that Sheila has at least one of these big guys too. And I, yeah. so, so what's the purpose of a multi-needle? Like, I think it's a 10 needle is it the one that you had to show. Um, we have, yeah, so the the slide, the picture we have is the um, Baby Lock Venture, which is the brand new 10 needle. Um, I think Sheila's probably going to agree with me when I say this. I think anybody who does a lot of test stitching, multi-needles are your best friend in the world because you can just set it and forget it and walk away from it. Um, but multi-needles are, you know, I don't want anybody to think a multi-needle is only for production. And it's not only just for someone who's got a business. Multi-needles are great um, just for everyday things because you can do things on a multi-needle a lot simpler than you can do some of the flatbed stuff. So, you know, think about uh, we're not too far away from Easter. And like I live down in the South and down here we do a lot of embroidery on Easter baskets. That's like a really popular thing is to embroider on Easter baskets. Can I embroider on Easter basket on a flatbed machine? Yeah, all day long. I can do it with no problem. But can I do it on a 10 needle faster, easier and with less frustration? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's a free arm, right? It doesn't have a flat bed metal on it. And so I can literally kind of shove something over it that's going to be in the round or what have you, or even something as simple as doing a, a embroidery on a polo, right? I, I can get this on a flat bed machine with no problem. But if I do it on a multi needle, it's like, two minutes of hooping on a flatbed versus 10 seconds of hooping on a multi-needle. So it's really just kind of, and if you have a design that has, you know, 75 color changes in it, well, if you've got a 10 needle machine, that's only seven color changes. If you've got a flatbed, that's 75 changes. Right. So. 
<laughs> right, exactly, exactly. That totally makes sense, absolutely. Yeah, very cool. So there's a whole variety of machines that can be used. The ones we've talked about today are the baby lock versions, um, which is what I sew on and what um, Sheila has as well. So I know that they worked very well. I've really, I've loved the machine. So I wanna talk a little bit more about some actual techniques. So once, cause a lot of us have gotten machines and then kind of like we're talking about with sergers, like it's the same with the embroidery machine. Like you can sometimes be intimidated by it and not really know. So that's what we're trying to do today is to get past the intimidation. So once we've gotten the machine and we've gotten some of the stabilizers and we know some of this stuff, but then there's these other things that we need to talk about, like these knockdown stitches. So explain what that actually is and then how do we make that happen? Sheila, you wanna take it? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Um, so a knockdown stitch functionally, uh, it, you can use it for a lot of different things and you can use it in a lot of different ways. When we're talking, um, it's functionally just a really light fill stitch and it generally runs one direction. It doesn't have a lot of texture in, in it and in itself. Its purpose is to knock down or flatten the, the pile of your fabric so that whatever border you're going to do later um, is it has a good surface to lay on. Um, you'll see knock down stitches on uh, people that do lots of monogramming of towels or um, baby baby blankets or baby bibs, um, and they're using terry cloth. They love knock down stitch, stitches on their designs, behind their designs, um, so, because it'll hold the terry cloth fibers down so that when you're doing your embroidery, you can still see what you wanted to embroider on there. So it just right. flops down the fabric. And on the software side of it, sometimes you can play with your knock down stitches to get them to do different things. So, um, there's a there's a lot of ways we can use knockdown stitching. Um, I, but I wanted I did want to show you. So I did some monogramming on some cuddle with and without knockdown stitching, just so you can kind of see. So this is without right. knockdown stitching, and this is just a real simple line work frame. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the lettering is nice and thick, so the lettering pops, but the the mo the actual monogram frame kind of sinks down into the stitches. But when I put, oops. See, because I'm in my car, everything's crazy. Um, when I put a knockdown <laughs> stitch behind it, now, now I can really see the frame. Oh. I mean, the frame really pops. So there's wow. some other things. You know, it's just, it really changes the embroidery and just lets you see it more. So I would not try to do a embroidery on cuddle or lex cuddle with a very fine design without using a knockdown stitch behind it. And a knockdown stitch is going to be something, um, some designs are going to include knockdown stitching and some designs you're going to have to do that yourself. You're either going to have to use your embroidery software or you're going to have to do something in your machine. Like uh, Mike, we were talking earlier, the Solaris has some quilting things that you can use kind of as a knockdown you know, so you're knocking down the fiber. And so you're basically quilting underneath it. You're just doing something behind the design. And and sometimes you're going to use your software, or if you have a machine with all those bells and whistles, you can just let your machine do some of that for you. So. Yeah. And there are designers. If, if you're, if you're somebody that doesn't have the, if your machine doesn't have the capability to create a knockdown, it doesn't have like on the baby lock machines, if you've got IQ designer, um, IQ designer on your machine, you can create knockdowns in IQ designer with no problem. Um, but if you're someone who doesn't have a machine that has that functionality built into it and you don't own software, the, there are a lot of actual digitizers out there who create shape knockdowns. So it may just be like a circle shape that is a knockdown stitch or a rectangle that is a knockdown stitch. So it wouldn't be like what Sheila just showed you, she created that so that it fit the, it actually fit the actual border. The B that I showed you, the knockdown fits the B. That was done with software. So, um, but there are possibilities, even if you don't own software, you don't own a machine that actually has that feature, there are options out there. So don't get discouraged just because you don't have that feature that's there. There's a lot of wonderful digitizers out there that actually do have knockdowns and you can add those to them. And they, they work just as well as just being a circle or a square or something like that. Some of the highest end towels I've ever stitched on, I literally used a circle knockdown and then did the uh, intertwined font on it. 
so that it was like the kind of it almost made it look like it was even more special because it wasn't the knockdown matching the shape it was a circle knockdown so it kind of gave it a little bit more elegance so there's so that's something i could just buy from somebody like online like i do the designs yeah absolutely yeah absolutely yeah and they'll label them as and, and just so everybody's not confused on this they'll label it as a bunch of different things it could be um, knockdown stitches it could be called nap control it could be called um uh, bat, batting down, I think is one that I saw, which I thought was really weird, bat downs or something like that. So there may be a bunch of different things, but if you'll read the description that the digitizer writes, it'll tell you what it's there for. And if they say it's to control pile, if you see those words, control pile, com control fluff or whatever, that's okay. the stitch. Got it. Good to know. And I know that um, in that handout that we did, there's um, on the back of it, there's a whole bunch of uh, recommended designers that uh, Sheila put in there. And I'm sure that some of those will probably have the same sort of thing available. And you were saying with the baby lock, it's the IQ designer. Is that what it's called? It's part of the program for the for the higher end machines? For the, for the, well, they're not just on the higher end, it's about midline up. Um, but okay. yeah, we have a program called IQ designer. And uh, if you have IQ designer, you can definitely do knockdowns through IQ Designer. It's not like a one hit wonder button or anything like that. It's a process, but yeah, you could create it for sure. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And so, the, and that's really, that needs to be done. It doesn't need to be done on every design. It needs to be done on them when we have like a high nap or thin lines in the embroidery, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So make sure we're doing this right. So <laughs> we can all make beautiful, beautiful embroidery designs. Okay. So the knockdown stitch, there was another one. Oh, we can answer that question later. Um, okay, so threads, is there anything I need to know? Like there's special threads. I always want to use a polyester, I'm guessing because it's polyester and knit and blah, blah, blah. Is that true? I would, I, I would use, I, I match my thread to the fabric that I'm using. So, okay. and, and I, I, I say that, and then there's times when we got to break the rules. And so we're going to use polyester thread or rayon thread on cotton. So, um, but generally, yes, I mean, cuddle and lux cuddle or polyester fabrics so they work beautifully with polyester threads so okay but I don't I feel discourage, like let's not discourage anybody if you've got a rayon thread and you want oh, to yeah, sure. that works <laughs> right. great too i mean That's it's right. totally right. personal preference but yeah i'm, right. I'm a but there, there is a difference between embroidery thread and sewing thread like you need yes. to buy embroidery thread and that like all of the stuff I got it comes on cones and I have some from Glide and I have some from Floriani and they're two different one is polyester and one is rayon and they behave a little bit differently I found yeah 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 and that's so, you know, test, test and experiment and yeah. and see what you like because and some people really love the softness of rayon threads I mean that's that's mm -hmm. real important to them so if that's real important to you and you know don't go out and buy 300 spools of anything before you know what it's going to do <laughs> <laughs> right right and like we were talking about um the machines sort of having a personality and i feel like with all of the machines that i've had they've had different personalities with regards to thread like some threads they like and some they don't like as much and i don't know why but yeah finding out what they like what they don't like before you invest because what i found is you really want all of the colors basically once you start you're like i think i started with 20 colors and then i was like oh i need more oh i need more how about more like you know? and all of a sudden i have a whole yeah a drawer full of thread colors so it's super fun i really i love that part about it um okay bobbin thread is a different kind of thread i found that out so i have white and black now are there other kinds kinds of bobbin thread? Well, you can get bobbin okay. thread in any color you want. I mean, they make every color in the rainbow is bobbin thread. Um, generally speaking, your bobbin thread is going to be a lighter weight than what your uh, upper thread is going to be. Mm -hmm. Not always, right? If we're doing stuff like pre-sanding lace or something like that, you may be winding your bobbin so it's the same thread top and bottom. But generally speaking, most people use a 40 weight thread on the top mm -hmm. and then use a 60 or an 80 weight thread in the bobbin. Um, so it just depends on kind of your machine. I would always follow whatever your manufacturer of your machine recommends as being used in the bobbin. Um, and following that, I know like if you get a baby lock machine, we actually include a spool of the recommended that we use. It's called finishing touch. Um, but you know, uh, there's also the big debate. Do I wind all of my bobbins or do I use pre-wound bobbins? Well, again, it's personal preference. <laughs> I, I'm going to be honest with you, unless I'm using a specific color and I'm doing something that I have to have a color that matches the top. I use pre-wounds um, and that's just out of convenience more than anything else. And um, 
but you know, it's, you can wind your own bobbins for sure. The one thing I would kind of warn about is it's really not recommended if you're buying pre-wound plastic bobbins that drop into your machine, it's really not recommended that you rewind those plastic bobbins because they're very oh. inexpensive plastic. And if they get a nick in them, that'll cause thread shredding. So that's um, very good to know. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah, I bought the I I got the spool of or the bobbin with the finishing touch on my machine, and then I bought more of that. Is what I do, and so I wind my bobbins. What I found is that it's a little bit like working with the cuddle, and that usually I work with I'll either work with a white, a medium gray, or a dark thread for whatever I'm sewing with cuddle. And I found it sort of the same way when I'm doing the embroidery is because whatever bobbin thread I had can sometimes show. So if I use a light color, I don't want to use the black on the back. Right. And vice versa, if you're using a bright color, the white on the back will sometimes pop through. It's very, it was very minimal. I did it on one specifically. Let me see if I can find my little example. So this one I did with black on the back because I wanted to see if it would mm -hmm. have any issues and I'll show you the front and it didn't. So even though it's black on the back, it was fine. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I can be lazy and that's great. I like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I do find that it did show a couple of times. I saw a little bit of black that would show in the white. It ends up stitching enough that it kind of hit it, but it was something that I was like experimenting. Yeah. Well, and, and there may be times where the, the color of the bobbin is really important because you, you're you boarding on something that's already finished. So if, if you receive a beautiful cuddle scarf from a friend who also sews with cuddle but they don't do embroidery and it's already finished so both sides are finished unless you want to take it apart and then mo monogram it um right. but then you you would match the bobbin thread to the back you know of the fabric so it's not as obvious unless you wanted it to stand out so and some people do some right. people like yeah. or don't mind or um and and sometimes it doesn't matter because you know, sometimes with your scarf, your tails are flapping and so you can see it. And then sometimes you're going to wear an infinity scarf where it's going to be next to your body and they're not going to see the back ever. So, you know, right. it just depends. But if it's you want that clean back, I would say you would have a matching bobbin because if you look at the back of embroidery work, perfect tension on your embroidery would have columns of three. So if you look at the back, it should be one third column top thread, one third column um, the bobbin thread, one third column top thread. So if you look at the back, if you didn't match your bobbin, it's going to kind of have a striped effect, which yeah. could be interesting yeah. in and of itself for sure. <laughs> but it might not be the look you're going for. Right, <laughs> exactly. Right. Okay. All right. Good, good. Um, needles, do we change the needles at all? Do we have a specific needle that you guys recommend? I'll let you go, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, you know, I know with cuddle, we're using a 9014 needle stretch needle when we're sewing. Right. 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 Um, I got to sew fast cause I got lots of things that I've got to sew. And so I have my embroidery <laughs> machine set up with 7511 needles. I don't find that I have a problem with them, but okay. I'm going back and forth between lots of different substrates. And so, but again, I've tested it. So I've tested it over and over and over again. And so just test it and see what happens. Uh, and also too, like, like it's a lot easier for me on my single needle machine to pop a different needle in than it is. I'm not going to change 15 needles on my 15 needle multi-needle all day long. No. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with no, it no and it's going to be okay. And I'm going to, I'm doing other things to compensate because I'm doing that over there. But on my single needle, yeah. yes, I'm going to pick, a, you know, a, a ballpoint needle on my embroidery machine. Yeah, mine was an 8012 and I've just stuck with that because I haven't had any issues with it. So yeah, it was an 8012 ballpoint with the for the embroidery machine. So yeah. that's what I've done and it's been totally fine. I feel like it's probably one of those like the others, like if you experiment and you're like, oh wait, that didn't actually work, then change your needle. <laughs> I'll be honest and say that if I wanted to say the textbook thing, I'd say, yes, I changed to a ballpoint and I do this. Yeah, I didn't. I, I used a 7511 embroidery needle and just went with it. And I, no there issue. You you know, I mean, it just honestly it's it's testing again finding out what works yeah. for you finding out what works on what you're stitching on but um i'm kind of like sheila i'm guilty of sometimes just looking at yeah i'm not changing all those needles it's just going to be what it is and and it works but you know it is a, right. since it is knit and it's stretched the technical correct way would be to switch to ballpoint right. and I, right. I i didn't i i i'll okay. admit it i'll throw that out there and, and own it <laughs> but that's well, one of those about things yeah, oh, we've got to learn the rules so we can break the rules, right? That's right. right exactly. <laughs> exactly. And what I feel like is we always recommend a 9014 stretch needle for sewing with cuddle because we it will skip stitches otherwise. With the for embroidery, sewing. I haven't found that it skips 
stitches. So yeah. for sewing, it makes a huge difference yes. whether you use the right needle or not. For the embroidery, I feel like it has been a little bit more, there's some fluidity there that it's not quite as important. Okay. All right. So I wanted to talk really quick about floating it because we've talked about like when you're hooping and everybody talked about hooping your fabric and then you hear about this floating idea. Um, and I know that that's what um, Sheila taught me to do. Is that what you do as well, Mike? I do. Yeah. I'm a huge floater. Yeah. I don't, I never hoop anything that can have hoop burn. Period. Okay, so, explain hoop burn. What so does that mean? Burn, I hear of that. Hoop burn is basically going to happen anytime you have a material that has a memory to it. So when you look at material that um, when you put it in the hoop and you actually do your embroidery, you take it out, and then and no matter what the fabric is, when you take it out of the hoop, it's going to have that ring where the fabric was in the actual hoop. Well, if we're yeah. doing like quilters cotton or something like that, we can take it over to the ironing board, hit it with a good iron, and that comes out, no problem. But if you got something that has like a really hard memory in it, such as anything with pile, anything with um, uh, fleece, anything that's got any kind of body to it whatsoever, it actually has that memory of those fibers in there. So once you squish it into your hoop, you can't get it out. Like you can even launder it and it won't come out a lot of times. So because mm -hmm. Cuddle has that pile to it, especially like the Lux Cuddle, because it's such a thick um, pile to it. If you tried to hoop that, it would just really leave a, a mark on the fibers that are there. And it's going to be really hard to get it to not ghost. And th that's what I kind of call it is ghosting it. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's really not that you've done any damage to it, but you basically have just put more memory into those fibers and you right. can't do it. So if you float it, you're hooping your stabilizer, but you're not hooping your actual fabric. Your fabric actually sits down on top of the hoop and then right. that's when it becomes super important to use like a basting stitch, right? So because I'm going to show really quick yeah. what, what we did because it's exactly what I got set up with my machine just so we could do it. So I yeah. stabilized the, I'll show, how I'll show you guys. So this is the medium weight tearaway that I stuck in there. I got it nice and tight. Sheila said like a drum, which I don't get it quite that tight. I'm usually, I'm not quite that good. And then I have used my 505 spray to get that to tack down. So you can see it's stuck there. Okay, so that's just over the hoop. This is right, Mike. This is what you're talking about, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So it's just over it. It's bigger. And then I've used some tape and got down my water soluble stabilizer. So I am ready to go. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is floating. And this, this, a lot of people use it. And I feel like it's one of those terms that you don't always know what it means when people say float your fabric. And you're like, what does that mean? What does it mean to float my fabric? That's that's what we're talking about. And the reason we do it, just to reiterate, is that it can leave marks in the fabric that we don't want, that may or may not wash out. And especially if you're gonna do it something that's larger than that, does it also affect how tight you get it in there? I feel like the nap of the fabric there or the, the thickness of it would make it so you couldn't get it quite as tight. Is that true? Well, there are some things you just cannot hoop. It's just too thick. I mean, think about it like, I always use the analogy of like the really like uh, high end luxury towels that you get like at hotels and stuff like that. We embroider on those mm -hmm. all the time, right? But could you imagine trying right. to get that inside of the hoop? You could not loosen the hoop enough True. to be able to True. get the actual fiber in there. So it's it's kind of battling two things. It's keeping you from getting hoop burn, but it's also letting you stitch on things that aren't necessarily hoopable, so to speak. So, right. you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Um, I know that, uh, Sheila, I think that you have some of the like, um, like magnet sort of hoops. Yeah. Is that what they are? I mean, that's, that's a real, like, that's a whole other thing in itself. Um, yeah. But, but you, you can, you, you can get those for all sorts of machines, right? You can. Mm -hmm. and, and some single okay. needle, um, there are some hoops that are available for single needle machines. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the... I, I love using a magnet hoop, but even when I'm using a magnet hoop, I'm still floating it sometimes because yeah. just, just because I don't want to squish, I don't want to squish the fluff, you know? Right. I, <laughs> right. Cause the magnets can actually leave burns as well. Right. The magnet right. can actually burn the fabric. We call it burning. It's obviously not burning it, but it could actually leave impressions in there. Um, but there's all kind of aftermarket hoops for your machines out there. You know, I mean, yeah. like the bee that I'm holding up, these were done on sticky back hoops. So these don't, you know, oh. I mean, there's no, there's no inside outside hoop at all. So um, there's all kind of different options that are on the market out there. You just have to kind of look and see what's available for your particular brand of machine and your, your model of your machine and see what's there and then make the decision if it's worth the financial investment to get those extra hoops and stuff. But the great thing right. is, is you can do it. You can float with the hoops that came with your machine. 
right? Yeah. So you can do it without having to do additional investment. So which is nice. Right. Right. Exactly. So it feels like it feels like there's there's so there's so much to this all. Um, and like the more that I learn about it, the more I want to do it, the more I'm like, I need all the toys. So, so I'm like, oh, there's that. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited about it. Um, one of the things also we've talked about with uh, technique wise is changing the height of the foot. Do you do you change yours at all, Sheila? I've heard that one told to me a few times. I by do. Google, is to raise the foot a little. You do. Yeah. Okay. On my on my baby lock, I can adjust the height of the presser foot. So it's not pushing down on the fabric because cuddle, even even the smooth C3 cuddle, the smooth minky has um, a three millimeter pile. So yeah. it's it's not flat like cotton. So I pushed it right. up a little bit. And when I do Lux cuddle, I raise it up even a little higher. But you 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 do need to you need to test out and see because sometimes when your foot is higher, you know, it's not holding your fabric down. So I'm, I'm not going to do it unless I've stabilized my fabric well. Have I adhered it to my hoop or have I used a basing box to keep the fabric to the stabilizer? Because that's really important. Otherwise, the presser foots, the, it, you know, it's so small, but it's not holding down the fabric to the, to the machine bed. Right. And the basting box you're talking about is that little square of big basting stitches that it'll do around design sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I know I... Yeah, that's built in. Yeah. And then Yeah, also, my machine will do that. Yeah. And but people with entry level machines, it may or may not do that. And so um you can look online and you can find free basing boxes all over the place. So yeah. oh, okay. Okay. So I was I was gonna ask, is that something that I would need to do on my sewing machine and then bring it to my embroidery machine? But you can actually get designs that are basting boxes. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Very good. See all this information we're getting. Okay, so I stitch throw, let me throw one okay. little word of caution out there, Teresa. For those of you yeah. who do raise your embroidery foot, um, there's I'm, I'm like Sheila. If it calls for it, do it. But the one thing that I see a lot of times is people will raise their embroidery foot for a project, and then they'll forget. And then so they what go, do they do if I forget to put it down? If they don't put it down, then they're going to wind up with what's called bird nest on the back of their actual project. So it actually wow. it allows the bobbin thread to be pulled up too far and it actually puts all this extra thread on the back of the project and it knots and breaks. So if you do what I always tell people, if you're going to do something like that, if you change a setting on your machine, we encourage you to do that. Right. Change the settings as you need to do that. But keep a pad of uh, sticky notes next to your machine. And if you do something like that, like you change the embroidery height, uh, the embroidery foot height, just write yourself a little note and say, check embroidery foot height, and then stick it on your screen of your machine and you won't forget. So that when you go to your next project and you don't need that extra height, you put it back to where it was and you won't wind up with that issue. So, um, cause I see that a, a lot when I'm teaching classes, like people like, I keep getting bird's nest and you go check. And the very first thing we always check is, what's the embroidery foot height. And a lot of times it's higher than what it should have been. So right. uh, just a little tip. <laughs> good to know. Good to know, because it is something that I've been, I've been told a few times is that you could do that and it'll change it. So it's nice to know that, yeah, you should definitely change that back or at least, you know, be aware that it can cause problems. So don't change it unless you need to is what I'm hearing. Right. right? Okay. All right. Good, good. The other one is stitch width. And I know that sometimes with the cuddle, um, so this will sort of um, come into play here a little bit, is the stitch width. If, if the satin stitch is wider, it will catch more of the cuddle um, and kind of get that in there because I know that the nap is wider. So that's true. And you can switch that in your machine settings for most machines. Is that true? Um, it's really more of a function of how the design has been digitized. So yeah. so that's, that's something that, okay. um, that the person, so like you, aren't, you're not going to get a design and then be able to manipulate the stitch width okay. very easily unless you have embroidery software and then you can play with the push and pull compensations but you can you'll learn as you get designs and you start playing with them you'll learn which designs work best with cuddle and what kind of width you're looking for so um, right. I happened to run across the design that my friend I, I'm going to show this one just because it's so beautiful and I just want to show it off it's really pretty but, um, this design, when I saw it, I was like, that's perfect. That's exactly what I want to stitch on with cuddle because this width, nice wide satin stitch around it. Uh -huh. I, did, I broke all the rules with this one. I did not use cutaway. <laughs> I did not use, um, I used 505 <laughs> spray, but um, I used tearaway and um, I didn't use a topper um, because I knew that this one was going to work great because of that wide satin stitch all around it and because it has some built-in knockdown stitches in it. And so um, mm -hmm. this, this design's by Bella Blue Designs and I think it's on the list as well. But 
it's going to hold everything down just perfectly the way I wanted it to. So it worked exactly the way I thought it was going to work with the cuddle. Um, but I knew because I've been doing this long enough that I knew that these nice wide satin stitches would work and they wouldn't get lost in the fabric. So when you're, if you have software, you can actually measure the width of the satin stitches in your design and you can adjust the, it's called the pull compensation. You want to raise that number so that the, it tells the needle to swing wider, to give it a little bit of extra um, to it. cover more fabric or to cover more width. And it's, it's a real subtle effect, but it really makes a big difference when you actually get to the part where you're stitching on something with an app. Right, right. And that totally makes sense. The pillow that you showed there, you said you didn't use a cutaway. So did you use a tearaway on that? I did, but I used a real soft okay. tear away that tore away. And did, did you tear out all the stuff in between all of those little, like the prisms in the heart? Did you take all I of those only, out too? I only tore away the ones that don't have stitching in them. So I tore away okay. this one, but not, not these ones that had a, it's kind of a knockdown stitch basically, you know? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that yeah. the stitches, it like really looks dimensional because the cuddle pops up and the knockdown flattens. Right. And so it was extra it was so extra i was like oh i got to do it right now <laughs> it's so good it's so good so in relation to that to, and to try to answer somebody else's question if you were to do that heart and you used a cutaway behind it would you cut out all those little pieces as well or would you leave it behind the heart i wouldn't because i don't want to work that hard <laughs> okay <laughs> that's sort of what i was thinking too <laughs> and mike was like no i don't it was a subtle like no don't cut them out just leave them there okay <laughs> Got it. So this is a little, um, so this is another little sample that I had that we showed this earlier. So this was something that I've had happen a couple of times with the cuddle when I do the Lux cuddle and it likes to pop out the side. Um, is there anything that I can do? Do I just trim it now? I think you're going to use your, um, you're going to use your applique scissors and you're going to just mm -hmm. trim those fibers off. And you know, the, guys. yes, or even the ones you had some little snips in there. Mm -hmm that you could mm -hmm. even use that are even a little bit finer. Um, sometimes they're called iris snips. These Are they these? Is this what you're talking about? With no, the tiny? they're the other ones. I see them over oh. there. They have a, yeah, those. These guys? Okay. Yes. So also, these are great because they have the teeny tiniest little tips on there. Um, but this, these are um, super nice. When do I use duck bills? Because people always talk about duck bills. When do I use those? Applique. Yeah. Applique. Okay. So when I'm cutting, when I did this originally, because what I did, because this is an applique, obviously I did a backing and then I did the, I don't even see, I don't have the words, you guys. It does the stitch that shows me where to put the fabric. Then I put it down, I stitch it and then I cut it really close. And right. I did, I used the duck bills and I only learned recently that the duck bill was supposed to go on the top and not the bottom, which was um, fascinating to me. So <laughs> I love, I love it with the, um, the applique with the cuddle. I think it's the cutest thing. Like it's a super fun way of using cuddle because you could do this. I did it on a piece of cuddle behind it, but you could 100% do this on cotton as well mm -hmm. and totally make all sorts of fun things. It's just super textural and great. I love it. It's so much fun. So applique, is there anything different really that we need to tell them about doing applique with cuddle? Some applique designs that that satin stitch that catches it. That's the part where we're um, concerned about the width of the satin stitch. And so, um, if you if you can tell, um, I like applique designs that have a four or even a five millimeter width applique to really catch that edge. And now sometimes you can't tell till you bring it, you know, to get it to your machine, and you're like, what happened here? So part of it is knowing your designer you know, and really, and spending some time trying different designers because different designers have a different style. And so you'll, you'll learn if, um, if the designer that you, you, you've been disappointed by a design, just try somebody else's. It doesn't mean that all appliques are bad. Just try a different brand, right? It's like, you know, your favorite cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. Yeah. I'm, you know, uh, I saw Reen Wilcoxon was in, was in here watching and she's a friend of mine and she has that like, thing that says, I like big hoops. I like fat satin stitches. I mean, that's <laughs> my thing. I'm, I'm a, uh, the more, the bigger the satin stitches, I think it's, um, I, I kind of use the saying that fat satin stitches hide a lot of sin, you know, because <laughs> yes. close enough, all that stuff. Yeah. So when I digitize, I'm, I'm just like, <laughs> Sheila, it's like, 
four and a half millimeters, five millimeters. If I'm feeling frisky that day, six millimeters. <laughs> it just depends on. They're super cute. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so for say, me, yeah. I feel like, she, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I will say the other thing too, is a lot of times whenever you're looking at the tack downs, um, when you do your tack down, if you see that you've got the fluff of the cuddle kind of hanging off to the sides, that's when you get to play barber and you get to go in and give it a haircut. Because if you'll do that before you do your satin stitches, you won't wind up with the little fluffy sticking out kind of like what you had there. You'll still wind up with it on occasion, but not quite as much. So, you know, that's when those little things come in. Got it. So after I've trimmed it, after I do that original stitch and then I have to trim it down, if I go past that and trim off it all off the little edge, then it won't catch it like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to give it a try because I know that um, this was an Anita Good Design um, design and I really, I love it. She, they have a whole, she, they have a whole um, collection of them that are a bunch of animals and I think they're adorable. I really want to do them more, but having to trim each one of them seemed like a pain in the rear. So I'm glad to know that I can just, you know, fix that beforehand. Um, there was something, oh, I was going to say, uh, so Sheila, a lot of your designs, because you work with Cuddle so much, because you're a Shannon Fabrics brand ambassador and do all of these things, your designs, I would assume, like you've tried them, tested them, you often show samples of them made with Cuddle. Is that something to like sort of look for? Because you've designed yours to work specifically with Cuddle, correct? Well, my ones that are specific for Cuddle, I'll say it everywhere. Like I say it in okay. the description, I say it in the tutorial. And, you know, okay, the, it doesn't mean that you can't use it on something else, but I've made it specifically to work with the Cuddle. Like this this polar bear face, um, I, I just got this one done, and I'm super happy with it. It just makes me happy. Super cute. Um, but you'll notice, so I've got nice fat satin stitches. I've got a fill stitch right here. And then, mm -hmm. but then if you look at my applique piece, it's just a blanket stitch. So it's not yeah. even a satin stitch. So there's all kinds of things that work with cuddle. It's just, you know, right. I, but I've done testing on it. So I knew it would work with this. I haven't tested right. on other fabrics. So I don't know if this would work. I mean, I'm sure it would work fine with cotton, but I know for it sure it's cute. Cuddle, right. So that's, <laughs> that's really important to me. But, you know, also too, I feel like sometimes we get a design and we just go straight to the machine and there's a tutorial in the file and we have no idea. And so like you see the picture and you want it and you go get it, but really you can, if you take a little bit of extra time and look to see if there was a tutorial in that design set, because generally the designer has a reason for doing it the way they did it. And so right. I see, I see sometimes, you know, we might, and I've done it too. I've bought a design because I wanted to do a thing and I, I, you know, I had something crazy that I was going to do and I had no idea what the intent of the designer was. <laughs> yeah. But, well, there's so many, there's so many designs and they're so cute. And I think that there is like, there's this learning curve of figuring out which ones work best for cuddle, but also reading the manual, like finding out what it was that they <laughs> had intended. Do they want us to do it that way? And if so, what do we do? Like, And I think you're right. Like a lot of designers, they actually include information that we Sometimes get too excited and then we just plow forward. Um, yeah. Oops. Or you bought yeah, the design I'm... a year ago and you have no idea where the design came from anymore okay. and it doesn't have the plow. Right. <laughs> right. right, right. So somebody had um, somebody had mentioned uh, in the comments on the I Love Cuddle group is that they were talking about like, okay, so I can buy all these designs, then what do I do with them? You just stick them on a thumb drive and move them over to your computer or over to your machine. That's all that I've done. Is there anything special that ever needs to be done? just don't store your designs on a thumb drive. That's the big thing that I see people do all the time is they literally like will buy a design and they'll store it on a thumb drive. And that's the only place that they have it. Thumb drives fail all the time, like right. all the time. So make sure right. you have it backed up somewhere else. And as far as it's mainly the biggest thing is just make sure you have it in the right format for your machine, you know, whatever, whatever the file format is that your machine reads, you know, um, make sure that that's the one that you're putting on the thumb drive and make sure you don't buy a design that exceeds the largest hoop size of your machine. So if your largest hoop is a five by seven and you go buy one that is, you know, six by eight, whenever you put it into your machine, your machine won't even show it being there. It'll actually just look as if there's nothing on the thumb drive um, because it can't, it can't read it. Yeah. So that's, I see that happen a lot. And then also, people don't realize this, but your machines actually have maximum number of stitches that it can read in the design, too. So if you have a design that has like just a ton of stitches and your machine can't read that many, same thing, it won't pick it up. Interesting. Good to know. And the and the, the file type, I know mine is a PES for the baby lock, and I'm assuming all the baby locks are the PES. Um, uh, so that always varies by brand. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so Baby Lock uses PES as our native format. So that's the one that they all read, but they will also read DSTs. Um, DST okay. is kind of a universal format. So most machines will read DSTs. Uh, the only thing to remember about DST is it doesn't remember colors. So it, remember, it remembers color changes, but not color information. So you may buy a really cute little polar bear in white, and then you put it in your machine, and all of a sudden your polar bear is neon green. So it's just, you got to remember right. that. Um, but yeah, most Good brands have their own suffix that they, that, that they use. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. And then each machine has a size that it will go up to. So be aware of that too when you're buying it. I know when I've bought designs, it'll ask me what size I want and what format. Right. And that's not always true, but I try to look for that. Because um, right. I feel like that'd be an easy uh, rookie mistake to be like, oh, I love this design and buy the wrong size, which would, yeah, really stink. Um, let me see if there was anything else. So we talked about applique. Um, we talked about where you can get a machine. We have talked about you can get some of these machines from the Baby Lock website, but we do recommend getting them from a dealer, um, partly because you can get lessons, you can get service, you can get more information. You agree? Yeah. Okay. I think it's so important to have a good retailer in your back pocket because it's I just agree. like, you know, I, I kind of equate it to, again, buying a car. When you go buy a car, you want to make sure it's at a dealer that you have a good relationship with so that you can get your car serviced. And if something goes wrong with it, you can take it in. So having a retailer that's standing with you as you go through this journey of, of learning your machine and, you know, the dealers are offering classes, the dealers will kind of also be able to tell you what works and what doesn't work on your machine. So if you wanted to buy accessories or stuff like that, they're a great guide. They give you kind of information on how that right. goes. So I, I'm right. all about a dealer. Yeah, and they're gonna be a great source for more designs and for all of the stabilizers and the threads and the needles and all of that good stuff. And I really, like you, I feel like there's a there's a need to connect with your your favorite local retailer um, yeah. about this and having them, yeah, in your back pocket that you can ask questions and get help from is really, really helpful. Um, all right, do you guys have anything else that you wanna add? I would love to hear, like, how do they stay in contact? So I know, Mike, you're an educator for Baby Log. How do they get in touch with you? How can they take your classes? All that good stuff. So the easiest way to get in touch with me is to join me on Facebook. So on Facebook, I actually run a group called Mama's Boy Design LLC. So uh, you can go out and find me there. It's, uh, it is a closed group. I do education on there every week. So every Tuesday night at 8 p.m., I do some kind of Facebook Live. Um, and then you can uh, find me through there. And if you uh, find me through there too, my email and all that kind of stuff is there, but it's just Mike at mamasboydesign.com and you can email me and all that kind of good stuff and then find me through Baby Lock as well. Great, and then you said eight o'clock and I assume that's that's Eastern time then. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm, good. I'm, we'll I'm in Georgia. Tonight, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so make sure we got our time straight here. Yeah. <laughs> we always tell people 10 and we're talking 1 p.m. your time. That's right. And Sheila, how do they find you? Uh, the best place to find me is in the Designs by Baby Moon Friends and Fans group, which um, that's my main place that I love to hang out. And so I'd love to have you guys come hang out with me there. And we do tutorials. We talk about we talk about embroidery all the time. And we talk about, you know, substrates and we talk about cuddle because I will talk about it all day long. Um, but uh, <laughs> if you want me, that's the best place to find me. Great, great. And then, of course, we're always, you know, here on the Shannon Fabrics page and on the I Love Cuddle page. So if you're interested at all in learning more about working with Cuddle Fabric, that's where you go for us. So we are at the I Love Cuddle is where you can find for all the consumers. And we always have lots of questions there and lots of answers. Like I said, Sheila hangs out there a lot as well. Um, so I appreciate you guys coming today. Thank you for spending an hour and a half with me talking cuddle. This has been great. I love working with the cuddle and embroidery and I'm learning so much. I learned a ton today. So thank you very much for all of that. We will post links and all of that good stuff in the comments. So I am, if we don't have a link already in the comment for his group and for Sheila's group, we will totally do that. Um, I wanna announce the winner today was Stephanie R. So congratulations, please reach out to us via Facebook Messenger to Shannon Fabrics, and we will um, get you a kit sent out to you. So please email us with your um, name, address, phone number, all of that good information, and we will send you a cuddle kit. And then you can, uh, you know, maybe just embroider a little bit on one of those. I know we didn't really talk about it, but those cuddle strips, have you done any quilts like that where they you embroider on it? Sheila, have you done that? I have, and I love cuddle strips. Cuddle strips are so fun. So I'm all yeah. about cuddle strips right now, yeah. yeah. 
So you could totally add this. So we talked about like individual embroidery, but this is something I've seen a lot is these, these um, blankets that people have embroidered like names and stuff on them. So anyway, there's a ton of ideas. We'll be back. We'll do this again because there's so much more that we can talk about. So, you know, give us a few more months. We'll be back. We'll talk more embroidery and cuddle. It'll be great. So thanks so much for joining us again. I appreciate it. We will be back next week for Sew Together Tuesday. Oh, next week we're talking about Embrace Double Gauze. So that'll be very fun. And we will be doing a little blanket. So um, come back, join us then. And um, until next week, happy sewing. Bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>